Chapter Eighteen of A Woman's War by Warwick Deeping. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen. Catherine's lips were tightly set as she turned from the shadows of Saint Antonia's elms, where the sunlight made a moving fret of gold upon the grass. The sky was a broad canopy of blue above the town, the wooden hills about it far and faint with haze. To Catherine, the summer stillness of the place, the dim blazoned windows of the church, the wreathing smoke, the circling pigeons, were parts of a quaint and homely tenderness that made her realise the more the repellent coldness of the house she had just left. She had come by one conviction through her visit, the conviction that those two intellectualists hungered to humiliate her and her husband. Mrs. Betty's eyes had betrayed too much she would be content with nothing but sensational headlines and the discussion of the scandal in every roxton home the brain behind that ethereal yet supercilious face knew no flush of feeling for a rival in distress the pair were exulting over the chance james murchison had given them and the wife had realized it with a bitter flooding up of loyalty and love catherine had made her plans before she reached the glare of lombard street she had left her husband sitting in the darkened room the blinds drawn down over his humiliation and self-shame her heart grieved in her for the strong man whose sensitive consciousness had been paralysed by the realisation of his own irrevocable blunder her pity left him undisturbed like a sick man needing rest inglis had taken the work for the whole day for catherine had interviewed him in the surgery and shocked the theorist by imparting a portion of the truth to him incredible had been mr inglis's solitary remark and catherine's heart had blessed him for that single adjective as she passed the house in lombard street her face seemed overshadowed for the moment by the unpropitious heaviness of her thoughts the vision of her husband's pale and troubled face saddened her more utterly than any regretfulness her pride might feel nor did she pass her home unchallenged for at the barred but open window of the nursery a ripple of gold in the sunlight bathed her daughter gwen's round face mother mother and a doll's red pelisse was waved over the window-sill catherine felt all her womanhood yearn longingly toward the child mother i've spelled a whole page daddy's gone out may i come with you catherine shook her head her eyes very bright with tenderness under her blue sunshade how little the child realized the grim beneathness of life no dear no i shall be back soon ask mary to take you for a walk in the meadows and she passed on with a lingering look at the red pelisse and the golden curls courteous carmagee white as to waistcoat brown as to face jumped up briskly from his well-worn leather chair when his head clerk announced mrs catherine murchison the lawyer despite his eccentricities was a keen and tenacious man of business the emphasis of whose advice might have impressed an audience more cynical than the english house of commons he had a habit of snapping at his syllables with a vindictive sincerity that stimulated nervous clients suffering from the neurasthenia of indecision what a professional visit my dear kate this is a most portentous event all my musty deeds must blush into new pink tape sit down do you want damages against your washerwoman for spoiling the underlinen believe me i have been asked to advise on such questions ah and how did your husband like my port an inward shudder swept through catherine the memories of that night at marley down were brutally vivid to her like the bizarre dreams of a feverish sleep remembered in the morning. Porteous had been the innocent cause of all the misery. Tell him she could not, that his very kindness had brought her husband to the brink of ruin. We ought to have thanked you, and the words clung to her throat. James has had one of his attacks of nervous depression and an endless amount of worry. Porteous Carmagee's keen brown eyes sparkled with intentness as he watched her face she looked white uneasy haggard about the mouth like one who has suffered from a strain of perpetual self-repression catherine had always moved before him as a serene being a woman whose face had symbolized the quiet splendor of an evening sky 
he had often quoted her as one of the few people in the world whose happiness displayed itself in the beauty of radiant repose the stain of suffering on her face was new to him and the more remarkable for that same reason you speak of worries kate am i to be concerned in them as a fatherly friend she tried to give him one of her happy smiles you see i have run to you because i am in trouble the pathetic simplicity of her manner touched him my dear kate and his voice lost its usual snappishness how can i serve you as a friend it is not usual to see you worried you know james has been overworked have i not lectured the rogue on a dozen different occasions yes yes i know and he was ill at marley down on sunday in the little place where i had hoped to give him rest oh porteous how brutal the responsibilities of life can be at times inglis our assistant sent for him to attend a serious case james's sense of duty dragged him away from marley he went braved a critical operation and she faltered her face aglow as though the very loyalty of her love made the confession partake of treachery the wrinkles about porteous carmagee's eyes seemed to grow more marked and made a mess of it kate eh his brusquerie passed with her as a characteristic method of concealing emotion yes <coughs> and he jerked one leg over the chair confound his sense of duty risking his reputation to ease some old woman's temper catherine looked at him with a quivering of the lips porteous you can't blame him it seems hard that one slip may undermine so much why undermine the law does not expect infallibility i know but then the man died who what man farmer baxter of boland's farm a fool who has been eating himself to death for years catherine spread her open hands with the look of a pathetic partisan james was not in a fit state to meet the strain the wife quarrelled with him after the operation and refused to let him continue the case my dear inferior females always quarrel and we have enemies so had the saints and plenty it was parker steele Porteous Carmagee sat up briskly in his chair, his wrinkled face twitching with intelligence. Now we are growing vital. Well, I can forecast that gentleman's procedure. Steele was called in, and the man died. Most natural of mortals. He performed the post mortem with Dr. Brimley of Cossington at the widow's request. As a result, he has refused to give a death certificate and has written to the coroner and mrs baxter has instructed cranston to institute an action against us for malpraxis and incompetence porteous carmagee sat motionless for a moment his legs tucked under his chair his brown face suggested of the ugliness of some carved medieval corbel i flatter myself that i recognize the inspiring spirit kate he said at last betty steele that's the lady we have learned to respect our capabilities mrs betty and i he pushed his chair back established himself on the hearth-rug and began the habitual rattling of his bunch of keys well kate you want me to act for you if you will if i will my dear girl don't insult my affection for you all i must confess that i like to feel vindictive when i undertake a case no city dinner could have made me more irritable vulpine and liverish in your service Catherine's eyes thanked him sufficiently, but they were still brimming with questioning unrest. Porteous, tell me what you think. My dear Kate, don't worry. How can I help worrying? The brown and intelligent face, like the face of a sharp and keen-eyed dog, lit up with a peculiar flash of tenderness for her. Come, Kate, I am not a full-blooded optimist, as you know, but your woman's nature makes the affair seem more serious than it is your husband was overworked and ill at the time yet these people insisted i take it on his assuming the full responsibility of the case steele is notoriously an unprincipled rival as for brimley of cossington the fellow is known as the most saintly humbug as ever made ginger and water appear as potent as the elixir vitae my dear kate i know more of the secret squabbles of this town than you do 
people have threatened to sue parker steel before now yes in this very room if spite and spleen are dragged into the case i think i can promise our opponents a somewhat stormy season a look of relief melted into catherine's eyes courteous carmagee was emphatic and women look for emphasis in the advice of a man you are doing me good porteous that's right the law is a crabbed old spinster but she can be exhilarating on occasions tell me when did you receive the challenge this morning by letter from whom parker steel and mr cranston exactly and your husband she faltered and looked aside james was deeply shocked by the thought of course of course he is a man with a conscience what is he doing i left him at home to rest i ought to tell you porteous that i have seen parker steel the lawyer frowned unwise kate unwise i hope no and she flushed hotly i made no pretence of weakness they had defiance from me good girl good girl they are bitter against us it was easy to discover that porteous carmagee drew out his watch in an hour kate i will run over and see your husband oblige me by telling him not to look worried now my dear girl nonsense you needn't catherine had risen and put her hands upon his shoulders and on that single and momentous occasion porteous carmagee blushed as his bachelor face was touched by the lips of june the words of a friend in the dry season of trouble are like dew to the parched grass catherine left porteous carmagee's office with a feeling of gratitude and relief as though the sharing of her burden with him had eased her heart from a feeling of forlorn impatience she sprang to a more sanguine and happy temper with her gloomier forebodings left among the deeds and documents of the dusty office she thought of her husband and her children with that wistful stirring of regret that fear lest some store of evil were being laid up for them in the home she loved her reprieve was but momentary had she but known it for the cup of her humiliation was not full to the brim as she turned into lombard street she came upon her two children returning with mary from a ramble in the meadows the youngsters raced for her eyes aglow health and the beauty thereof in every limb the omen seemed propitious the incident as sacred as catherine could have wished perhaps to the two children her kisses seemed no less warm and heart-given than of yore but to the mother the moment had a meaning that no earthly poetry could portray ah my darlings where have you been mother where at uncle porteous's mary run around to arnsbury's and ask him to send me in some fruit i will take the children home mary departed leaving youth clinging to the maternal hands master jack murchison pranced like a war-horse his curiosity still cantering towards marley down oh i say mother when are we going to the cottage saturday dear perhaps daddy said we might have tea in the woods boys who put pepper on the cat's nose don't deserve picnics master jack giggled over the originality of the crime old tom did sneeze you was very cruel jack and gwen's face reproved him round her mother's skirts little girls don't know nothing i can spell fuchsia i can what's the use of spelling any one can spell can't they mother no dear and the mother laughed many people are not as far advanced as gwen they were within twenty yards of the great house in lombard street with its warm red walls and its white window frames when a crowd of small boys came scattering round the northeast corner of st antonia's square in the middle of the road a butcher had stopped his cart and several people were loitering by the railings under the elms watching something that was as yet invisible to catherine and the children i specs it's punch and judy and master jack tugged at his mother's hands wait dear wait mother may i give the toby dog a biscuit two gwen if you like i just love to see old punch smack silly old judy with a stick jack you are very cruel 
and the little lady disassociated herself once more from all sympathy with her brother's barbaric inclinations a man turned the corner of the street suddenly cannoned two small boys aside and hurried on with the half-scared look of one who has seen a child crushed to death under a cart he stopped abruptly when he saw catherine and the children his white and resolute face glistening with sweat mrs murchison take the children in catherine stared at him it was john reynolds her husband's dispenser what is it what has happened the man glanced backward over his right shoulder as though he had been followed by a ghost dr murchison was taken ill at the county club they sent round for me good god ma'am get the children out of the way for a moment catherine stood motionless with the sun blazing upon her face her eyes fixed upon a knot of figures dimly seen under the shadows of the mighty elms a great shudder passed through her body she stooped caught up gwen and carried the wandering child into the house reynolds the dispenser followed with the boy who rebelled strenuously his querulous innocence making the tragedy more poignant and pathetic shut up silly old reynolds there there master jack and the man panted be quiet sir mrs murchison i must you understand catherine her face wonderful in its quite restraint her eyes full of the horror of keen consciousness hurried the two children up the stairs outside in the sunlit street the club porter and a labouring man were swaying along with an unsteady figure grappled by either arm the troop of small boys sneaked along the sidewalk and on the opposite pavement some dozen spectators watched the affair incredulously across the road dang me if it ain't the doctor what jim murchison drunk as blazes a little widow woman in black slipped away with a shudder from the coarse voices of the men how horrible and she looked ready to weep for she was one of murchison's patients and had known much kindness at his hands john reynolds had gone to help the two men get murchison up the steps into the house good god sir he said pull yourself together let me go reynolds i can walk steady sir steady for the love of your good lady get inside and between them they half carried him into the house three men awed by a strong man's shame catherine had locked the two children into the nursery and stood on the stairs and saw the limp figure of her husband lifted across the hall into his consulting room it was as though fate had given her the last most bitter draught to drink their cause was lost she felt it to be the end reynolds the dispenser came to her across the hall the man was almost weeping so bitterly did he feel the misery of it all i i have sent for dr inglis thank you reynolds shall i stay yes for god's sake do the other two men came out from the consulting room and crossed the hall sheepishly without looking at catherine she turned and reascended the stairs leaving to reynolds the task of watching by her husband the sound of a small fist beating on the nursery door seemed to echo the loud throbbing of her heart she steadied herself choked back her anguish unlocked the door and went into the children mother mother gwen's eyes were full of tears yes darling yes is daddy ill daddy daddy is ill and she took the two frightened children in her arms and wept End of chapter 18chapter 19 of a woman's war by warwick deeping this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter 19 by certain scientific thinkers life is held to be but a relative term and the definitions of the ancients have been cast aside into the very dust that they despised as gross and utterly inanimate whether radium be alive or no the thing we ordinary mortals know as life shows even in its social aspects a significant sympathy with the spencerian definition the successful men are those who react and respond most readily and most selfishly to the externals of existence vulgarly we call it the seizing of opportunities though the clever merchant may react almost unconsciously and yet instinctively 
to the market of the public mind. All life is an adjustment of relationships, of husband to wife, of mother to child, of cheat to dupe, of capital to labour. Thus, in social death, so to speak, a man may be so placed that he is unable to adapt himself to his surroundings. His reputation dies and disintegrates like a body that is incapable of adjusting itself to some blighting change of climate. Or, in the terminology of physics, responsible repute may be likened to an obelisk whose instability increases with its height. A flat stone may remain in respectable and undisturbed equilibrium for centuries. The poised pinnacle is pressed upon by every wind that blows. The fall of some such pinnacle is a dramatic incident in the experience of the community. The noise thereof is in a hundred ears, and the splintered fragments may be gaped at by the crowd. Thus it had been with James Murchison in Roxton Town. Neither doctors nor engine drivers are permitted to indulge in drink and in Murchison's case the downfall had been the more dramatic by his absolute refusal to qualify the disgrace. An inquest, an unflattering finding by the coroner's jury, a case for damages threatening to be successfully instituted by an outraged widow. Amid such social humiliations, the brass plate had disappeared abruptly from the door of the house in Lombard Street. It was as though Murchison's pride had accepted the tragic climax with all the finality of grim despair. He had even made no attempt to sell the practice, but, like Cain, he had gone forth with his wife and with his children, too sensitive in his humiliation to brave the ordeal of reconquering a lost respect. Many months had passed since the furniture dealer's vans had stood in the roadway outside the house in Lombard Street with bass and straw littering the pavement, and men in green baize aprons going up and down the dirty steps. Frost was in the air, and the wintry sun burned vividly upon the western hills. A fog of smoke hung over the straggling town, lying a dark burr amid the white-misted meadows. Lights were beginning to wink out like sparks on tinder. The dull roar of a passing train came with hoarse strangeness out of the vague windings of the valley as the dusk fell a smart pair of bays switched round the northwest corner of st antonia's square and clattered over the cobbles under the spectral hands of the towering elms the church clock chimed for the hour as parker steel furred like any russian stepped out of the brougham and slamming the door sharply after him ordered the coachman to keep the horses on the move Dr. Steele's brougham was not the only carriage under St. Antonia's sleeping elms. A steady beat of hoofs and a jingling of harness gave a ring of distinction to the quiet square. Parker Steele glanced at the warm shadows of his house as he crossed the pavement and fumbled for his latch-key in his waistcoat pocket. The sound of music came from within, ceasing as the physician entered the hall, and giving place to the brisk murmur of many voices. A smart parlour-maid emerged from the drawing-room carrying a number of teacups, blue and gold, on a silver tray. The babble of small talk unmuffled by the open door suggested that Mrs. Betty excelled as a hostess. Ten minutes elapsed before Parker Steele, spruce and complacent, was bowing himself into his own drawing-room, with the easy unction of a man sure of the distinction of his own manners. Quite twenty ladies were ready to receive the physician's effeminate white fingers. Mrs. Betty had gathered the carriage folk of Roxton round her. The heat of the room seemed to have stimulated the scent of the exotic flowers. The shaded standard lamp, burning in the bay window beside the piano, shed a brilliant light upon a pink mass of azaleas in bloom. Mrs. Betty herself was still seated upon the music stool, one hand resting on the keyboard as she chatted to Lady Sophia Gillingham, sunk deep in the luxurious cushions of a lounge chair. Mrs. Betty, a study in saffron, her pale face warmed by the light of the lamp, caught her husband's eye as he moved through the crowded room. Sleek, brilliant, 
pleased as a cat that had been lapping cream she made a slight gesture that he understood a gesture that brought him before lady gillingham's chair parker yes dear will you touch the bell for me i want to show mignon to lady sophia parker steele's smile congratulated his wife on her deft handling of the weapons of social diplomacy he rang the bell and meeting the servant at the door desired her to bring mrs betty's blue persian and the basket of kittens from before the library fire the physician took personal charge of mignon and her children and returning between the chairs and skirts presented the family to lady sophia parker steel had an ecstatic lady at either elbow as he held the basket lined with red silk the three mouse-coloured kittens crawling about within mignon the amber-eyed had made a leap for mrs betty's lap the dears how absolutely sweet such tweety pets the two elderly canaries cheeped in chorus while lady sophia's fat and pudgy hand fondled the three kittens her red and apathetic face became more human and expressive for the moment though there was a suggestion of cupidity in her dull blue eyes the dear things and she lifted one from the basket into her lap where it mewed rather peevishly and caught its claws in lady sophia's lace mignon is a prize beauty and mrs betty caressed the cat and looked up significantly into her husband's face perfectly lovely there there pet what a fuss to make and the dowager's red-knuckled hand contrasted with the kitten's slate-grey coat i suppose they are all promised mrs steele well to tell the truth they have created quite a rage among my friends no doubt the dears you could ask quite a fancy price for such prize kittens parker steel had been prompted by an instant flash of his wife's eyes i am sure if lady gillingham would like one of the kittens he appeared to glance questioningly and for approval at mrs betty of course i shall be delighted really why yes then may i buy one parker steel elevated his eyebrows and with the air of a lester refused to listen to any such proposal do not mention such a matter we shall only be too glad but my dear mrs steel i agree wholly with my husband and mrs betty stretched out a white hand and stroked the ball of fluff in lady sophia's lap choose which you like they can leave the mother in a week or two lady gillingham's plebeian face beamed upon mrs betty this is really too generous why not at all and her vivacity was compelling then may i choose this one with pleasure isn't it a pet mignon purring on mrs betty's lap failed to realize in the least how valuable a social asset she had proved there was a rustling of skirts a shaking of hands as the room began to empty of its silks and laces lady sophia struggled up with a fat sigh from the depths of her chair stroked mignon's ears and held out a very gracious hand to mrs steele can you dine with us on monday delighted sir gerald gerson and the italian ambassador will be with us i want to show you some choice dresden that my husband has just bought at christie's mrs betty received the favour with the smiling and enthusiastic simplicity of an ingenuous girl how kind of you i am so fond of china parker steel gave his arm to the great lady and escorted her to her carriage his deportment a professional triumph in the consummation of such a courtesy he found mrs betty alone in the drawing-room when he returned she was lying back in the chair that lady gillingham's stout majesty had impressed and had mignon and a kitten on her lap parker steel standing on the hearthrug looked round him with the air of a man to whom the flowers in the vases the lilies and azaleas in bloom seemed to exhale an incense of success 
social prosperity and an abundance of cash the expensive armchairs appeared to assert the facts loudly a satisfactory party dear eh mrs betty fondling mignon's ears looked up and smiled i think we have conquered boadicea at last she said it appears so she should be a most excellent advertisement parker steel fingered his chin and looked meditatively at the carpet a self-satisfied and half-cynical smile hovered about the angles of his clean-cut mouth a year ago betty he remarked lady sophia pertained to catherine murchison and showed us the cold shoulder well we have changed all that we well say the workings of the spirit or the infirmities of the flesh mrs betty held mignon against her cheek and laughed what a dear soft fluffy thing it is set a cat to catch a cat eh i wonder what our friend murchison is doing murchison i never troubled to think parker steel studied his boots poor devil he made a pretty mess of a first-class practice they were hard up too i imagine damages and costs must have cleared out most of murchison's investments and their furniture sold dirt cheap i can't tell why the ass did not try to sell the practice pride i suppose it meant making me a present of most of his best patients my dear parker never complain hardly when we should be booking between two and three thousand a year at least well i must turn out again before dinner the physician returned to his fur coat and his brougham leaving mrs betty fondling mignon and her kittens end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of a woman's war by warwick deeping this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty a hundred rows of mud-coloured brick boxes set face to face and back to back scores of cobbled streets a grey band of stone and two grey bands of slate interminable brown doors and dingy windows interminable black and sour back yards festoons of sodden underclothing moping chickens caged up in corners rubbish broken boxes cinder heaps and smoke hardness in every outline in the dirty yellow walled houses in the faces of the women and in the crude straightness of every street an atmosphere of granite brick cast iron and slate no softness of contour no flow of curves no joy in the sweep of land or sky the colour scheme a smirch of grey yellow and dingy red scarcely a streak of green in the monotonous streets the sky itself at best a dusty blue sliced up into lengths by slate roofs and cast-iron gutters to the south of this wilderness of brick and stone rose the chimneys and cage wheels of the wilton collieries here the sketch had been worked in charcoal black wharves beside a black canal hillocks of coal black smoke black faces the whir of wheels the grinding of shovels the banging of trucks being shunted to and fro along the sidings the eternal spinning of the cage wheels the panting and screaming of engines the toil and travail of a civilization that disembowels the very earth in wilton high street where electric trams sounded their gongs all day and cheap shops ogled the cheap crowd there was a broad window that had been coloured red and topped by a line of gold some eight feet above the pavement on this sanguinary window ran an inscription in big black letters dr tugler m r c s l r c p consulting hours eight to ten and six to nine consultations one shilling medicines included those beshawled ladies who carried their rickety infants into dr tugler's shop might find the doctor and one of his two professional assistants seated in the two cheap cane-bottomed armchairs before two base-topped tables there were wooden benches round the room a glass-fronted cabinet in one corner medical almanacs on the walls 
a placard over the mantelpiece instructing patients to bring their own bottles. An inner door with ground glass panels led to a dingy surgery, a white sink in one corner, and a dresser littered with instrument cases, packages of lint, reels of plaster, and boxes of bandages. A third door opened from the surgery into the dispensary, a veritable bower of bottles, lit by a skylight, a ledger desk under the gas jet in one corner, medicine glasses standing on the sloppy drug-stained dresser, a spirituous reek filling the little room. Oilcloth, worn patternless, covered all the floors. The gas jet in the surgery flared perpetually through all the winter months, for the skylight was too small and dirty to gather much light from the December skies. It was Saturday night at Wilton, and hucksters were shouting up their wares in High Street, despite the fine and almost impalpable rain that wrapped everything in a dismal mist. The gongs of the tram cars clanged impatiently past Dr. Tugler's surgery, where a row of stalls ranged beside the pavement gathered a crowd of marketers under their naphtha lamps. Trade had been busy behind the red window that Saturday evening, Piles of shillings and sixpences lay in the drawer of Dr. Tugler's consulting-table. Small change left by anemic, work-worn women, who needed food and rest more than Dr. Tugler's cheap and not very effectual mixtures. The room had been full of the bronchitic coughing of old men, the whining of children, the scent of wet, warm, dirty clothes. The front room had emptied itself at last, an old woman with a cancerous lip being the last to go. Dr. Tugler was sitting at the table nearest to the red window, counting up the miscellaneous and greasy pile of small coins, and packing them pound by pound into a black handbag that lay across his knees. He was a vulgar little man with a cheerful, blustering manner, and a kind of plump and smiling self-assurance that was never at a loss for the most dogmatic of opinions. Among the Wilton colliery folk, he was known distinctively as the Doctor. A man of finer fibre might have been wasted amid such surroundings. Dr. Tugler, florid, bumptious, ever ready with a semi-decent joke, and boasting an aggressive yet generous aplomb, contrived to impress his uncultured clients with a sense of sufficiency, and of rough and ready power. But for his frock-coat, and for the binaural stethoscope that dangled from the top button of his fancy waistcoat, he might have been taken for a prosperous publican, a bookmaker, or a butcher. Dr. Tugler swept the remaining small change into his bag, locked it, and jumped up with the air of a man eminently satisfied with the day's trade. The assistant at the other table was pencilling a few notes into a pocket-book, and humming the tune of a popular music-hall song. The surgery door opened as Dr. Tugler deposited the black bag on the mantel-shelf, and a swarthy collier, with one hand bandaged, came slouching out, swinging an old cap. "'Good night, Doctor.' Dr. Tugler faced round with his hand stuffed into his trousers' pocket. "'Hello, Smith. Find the knife sharp, eh?' The man grinned and glanced at his bandaged hand. "'There was a tidy lot of muck in it,' he said. Good thing we've saved the finger. Page your bob, eh? Right. Keep off the booze and go straight home to the missus. Tugler turned down the gas jets and entered the surgery. A big man in a white cotton coat was bending over the sink and washing a porcelain tray under the hot water tap. Blood-stained swabs of wool lay in an old paper basket under the sink. A couple of scalpels, a pair of dressing forceps and scissors, a roll of lint, dental forceps still clutching a decayed tooth, an excised cyst floating in a bowl of blood-stained water. Such were the details that completed the picture of a general surgeon at work. Dr. Tugler cast a quick and observant glance round the room, turned down the gas a little, and counted the bandages in a cardboard box on the dresser. Feel fagged, Murchison, eh? The big man turned, his lined and powerful face wearing a look of patient self-restraint. "'No, thanks. Be easy on the bandages.' And Dr. Tugler gave a frowning wink. 
we can't do the beggars a la west end on a bobber time the big man nodded and began to clean his knives a message has just come round from cinder lane number ten primip glad if you'd see to it i feel dead bagged myself an almost imperceptible sigh and a slight deepening of the lines about murchison's mouth escaped dr tugler's notice i will start as soon as i have cleaned these instruments number ten is it yes here's the week's cash dr tugler wrapped down three sovereigns and three shillings on the dresser and turning into the dispensary busied himself by inspecting the contents of the bottles with the critical eye of a man who realises that details decide the difference between profit and loss in ten minutes murchison had taken off his white cotton coat pocketed his money put on a blue serge jacket and overcoat and taken a rather shabby bowler from the peg on the surgery door he picked up an obstetric bag from under the dresser and crossing the outer room with a curt good night to his fellow assistant plunged into the glare and drizzle of wilton street despite the rain the sidewalks were crowded with saturday night bargainers who loitered round the stalls under the flaring naphtha lamps the strident voices of the salesmen mingled with the clangour of the passing teams and the plaintive whining of the overhead wires here and there the glare from a public house streamed across the pavement and through the swing doors murchison as he passed had a glimpse of the gaudy fittings the glittering glasses the rows of bottles set out like lures to catch the eye the bars were crowded with men and women the discordant hubbub of their voices striking out like the waters of a mill-race into the more even murmurs of the street the man with the bag shuddered as he passed these glittering dens and felt the hot breath of the drink beast on his face his eyes seemed to fling back the glare of the lights with a fierceness that was not far from fanatical disgust possibly there was an element of mockery for him in the coarse chattering and the braying laughter his fingers contracted about the handle of the bag he seemed to hurry with the air of some grim wayfarer in the pilgrim's progress escaping from sights and sounds poignant with the prophecies of despair in cinder lane murchison found the door of number ten half open and a man sitting reading in his shirt sleeves in a little front parlour a significant whimpering came from the room above the first faint cry of a newborn child a flash of relief passed across murchison's face the sound reprieved him from a possible night watch in the stuffy heat of a room that smelled of paraffin stale beer and unwashed clothes all over i think the man with the paper rose removed his clay pipe jerked back his chair and grin just so doctor so much the better for everyone lord love you doctor i feel as though i'd been sitting on hot coals for ten mortal hours murchison swung his overcoat over a chair and climbed the stairs a half-open door showing a band of light blotted by the shadow of a woman's head the proud father returned to his pipe and to his paper and the mug of beer on the table at his elbow he looked a mere lad sickly beardless hatchet-faced with high shoulders and no chest coal dust seemed to have been grimed into the pores of his greasy and, and wax-white skin the lad's smirk was a quaint mixture of pride and sheepishness when murchison came down the stairs half an hour later and congratulated him on the possession of a son glad it's over doctor have a drop and he reached for a clean glass murchison's face hardened no thanks very much your wife has come through it very well the man put his paper down and held murchison's overcoat for him well it's a mercy doctor that it ain't twins not a double responsibility eh the lad winked why there's a cove been writing in this paper as how every man ought to have a whopping family i should like to ask him how about the bread and cheese and the beer perhaps there doctor only two bob a week regular that ain't ruination it's a bit sweaty down in the coal hole i give the missus most of the money so do i and murchison smiled at the lad with something fatherly in his eyes you do that doctor i do 
"'Well, there ain't much mistake in making the missus your banker "'when she's clean and tidy and looks to a man's buttons.' Murchison turned out again into the drizzling rain and swung along a dozen dreary streets that resembled each other much as one curbstone resembles another. A church clock was striking eleven as he reached a row of little red brick villas on the outskirts of the town, with a dirty piece of wasteland in front and the black canal behind. He stopped before a gate that bore, as though in irony, the name Clavelli. There was no blue boundless Atlantic, within glimpse of wilton town no flashing up of gold coastlines in the sunlight no towering cliffs piling green foam towards a sapphire sky the front door opened at the click of the garden gate if ten square feet of garden and a gravel path could be flattered with the name of a garden a woman's figure stood outlined by the lamp burning in the hall she was dressed in a cheap cotton blouse and skirt of dark blue serge but the clothes looked well on her, better than silks on the body of another. Her husband's face drew out of the darkness into the light. Catherine's eyes had rested half-questioningly on it for a moment. The eyes of a woman whose love is ever on the watch. "'I am late, dear,' and he went in with a feeling of tired relief. They kissed. "'Come, your supper is ready. "'Dear me, what a long day you have had!' and she glanced at the bag, understanding at once what had kept him to such an hour. "'How are the youngsters?' "'Asleep since nine. Catherine took his coat and hat, and put her arm through his as they went into the little front room together. A coke fire glowed in the diminutive grate, a saucepan full of soup stood steaming on the trivet. Murchison sat down at the table that was half covered by a white cloth. At the other end lay his wife's work-basket, with a dozen pairs of socks and stockings. Her eyes had been tired before the opening of the garden gate. Now they were bright and vital, for love had wiped all weariness away, that heroic, quiet love that conquers a thousand sordid trifles. Saturday is always busy. I know. And she smiled as she poured him out his soup. I think we had nearly a hundred people tonight. "'Thanks, dear, thanks,' and he touched her hand. Catherine sat down on the sofa and took up her stockings, seeing that he was tired, too tired to care to talk. Her woman's instinct was rarely at a loss, and a tired man appreciates restfulness in a wife. When he had finished, she rose and drew the solitary armchair before the fire, and brought him his pipe and his tobacco. Murchison's face softened. He never lost the consciousness of all she had forgiven. He drew out the week's money when they had talked for a while, and handed the three sovereigns to her, keeping only the three shillings for himself. Catherine wore the key of their cash-box tied to a piece of ribbon round her neck. It was Murchison who had insisted on this precaution. Every week he gave the money to her, and saw her locket in the cash-box on her desk. "'Shall I still keep the key, dear?' "'Keep it.' "'Yes,' and she coloured like a girl. "'You know that I trust you.' "'I know it, but I have sworn to myself, dear, to risk nothing.' She rose slowly and put the money away, glad in her heart of his quiet and determined strength. "'I understand. "'That I mean to crush this curse now, once and for ever.' Murchison finished his pipe, and Catherine put her work away. The front door was locked, the gas turned out. Husband and wife went up the stairs together, Catherine carrying the lighted candle. She opened a door leading from the narrow landing, and they went in, hand in hand, to look at their two children who were asleep. A wistful smile hovered about Murchison's mouth. Poor little beggars, they don't see much of me. He was thinking of the past and of the future. Indeed, he thought the same thoughts nightly as he looked at the two heads upon the pillows. Gwen is looking better again. Is she? And he sighed. We had quite a long walk today before it began to rain. They spoke in undertones, Murchison leaning over Gwen's little bed. He looked at her very lovingly, as though wishing to feel her small arm about his neck. Good night, little one. "'Good night, Mischief Jack. 
and he turned to his wife with the air of a man repeating a solemn and nightly prayer. End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of a woman's war by warwick deeping this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one failure is bitter enough in itself to a man of energy and strength of purpose but more bitter still are the humiliations and the sufferings that failure may impose on those he loves reputation resources his very home had been swallowed up but in murchison there was that dogged northern spirit that stubborn uplift against odds that is at its strongest when confronted with defeat like a man brought to the edge of a black cliff at night he had looked down grimly into the depths depths that waited not for him alone but for the innocent children who held his hands as a cheap assistant in a colliery town james murchison had joined issue with his own unfitness for the ordeal of life a tight-mouthed and rather silent man he had entered upon the rebuilding of his self-respect with the dogged patience of a titan the little red brick villa with the dirty piece of wasteland in front and the black canal behind might have suggested no stage for heroic drama to the casual eyes of murchison's neighbours the big brown-faced man stalked to and fro to work quiet and unobtrusive a figure that was soon familiar to most of the middle-class people who lived on either side he seemed one of those many mortals who move through life without a history an ant in an ant world busy monotonously busy earning his paltry pounds a week without glamour and without fame man suffers most in seeing those dear to him in suffering and the tragic tones of life are caught from the lips of those he loves the wounds of a wife or of a child are open in the heart of the husband or father remorse or self-accusation if there be cause for such a feeling is as the vinegar on the sponge to the man crucified by his own sin one has but to come in contact with the material side of civilization to discover how desperately sordid this twentieth century life can be how great the contrast was between roxton lying amid its woods and meadows and the dismal colliery town murchison as a father realized too soon the one smelled of the fresh earth primal and invigorating the other of soapworks soot cabbage water and rancid oil in roxton the mortality was low in the colliery town hundreds of infants died yearly before they were four weeks old such realism the vivid heritage of thousands might well make a man go grimly through life the burden of care very heavy on his shoulders to watch a wife's face fade despite her courage poverty and sorrow bring in weariness to the serenest eyes to know that drudgery burdens the dear life of the home to watch the lapsing of a child from sheer health into sickness the beautiful aliveness vanishing the bloom marred like the bloom on handled fruit the consciousness of dependence and obligation the receiving of brusque instructions from a man of cheap and vulgar fibre sordid surroundings sordid neighbours an utter dearth of friends work eternal work day in day out no sabbath rest no time for home life no money to give joy to those most dear a vivid ghost passed following like a shadow a dim and unflattering future before the eyes a future darkened by the prophetic dread of leaving wife and children alone in a selfish world such were the realities that filled james murchison's sphere of consciousness realities that were responsible for many a sleepless night it was the afternoon of a february day when murchison stopped before the theatre in wilton high street for the colliery town delighted in melodrama and pulling out a pigskin purse examined the contents with critical consideration he had saved a few shillings by stinting himself in tobacco and in his daily lunch at a cheap eating-house near dr tugler's surgery the pantomime puss in boots was still running at the theatre and at the box-office murchison bought four tickets for the upper circle 
In the old days the children had gone up yearly to Drury Lane, and Master Jack had been making many allusions to the gaudy posters covering a hoarding near the row of red brick villas. More than once the boy's thoughtless words had hurt the father's heart. It was chiefly of Gwen that Murchison thought as he thrust the envelope with its yellow slips into his breast pocket. At Clavelli, Catherine, her sleeves turned up, stood in the little back kitchen making a suet pudding. The Murchisons had dispensed with a servant because of the expense, for their income had practically no margin, and money had to be scraped together to pay the yearly dividend on the husband's life insurance. Catherine's mother, a somewhat stern, pious, and bedridden old lady, living in a respectable south coast town, allowed her daughter a small sum each year. Mrs. Pentherby was the possessor of a comfortable income, but suffered from a meanness of mind and a severity of prejudice that had made her rather merciless to Murchison in the hour of his misfortune. Such money as she sent was to be spent solely on the children. Catherine's face had often reddened over the contents of her mother's drastic and didactic letters. Her love and her loyalty were hurt by the old lady's blunt and puritanical advice. As for James Murchison, he had too much pride to even dream of touching Mrs. Pentherby's earmarked donations to his children. On several occasions a five-pound note had reached Clavelli anonymously from another quarter. Murchison had suspected Porteous Carmagee of this noiseless generosity, but he had been unable to discover whence the money came. The little lawyer of Lombard Street alone knew how the phenomenal damages according to Mrs. Baxter by a sentimental jury had swept away all Murchison's savings and even the money realised by the sale of his furniture and his car. Yet these five-pound notes were always placed in Catherine's hands to be deposited in the post-office savings bank in Gwendolyn Murchison's name. At Christmas a huge hamper had reached them from Roxton, a hamper whose bulk had symbolised the abundant kindness of Miss Carmagee's virgin heart. Friends in adversity are friends worthy of honour, and Miss Carmagee, good woman, had packed the hamper with her own fat and generous hands. Catherine, her forearms white with flour, stood in the little back kitchen, tying a piece of cloth over the pudding bowl before sinking it in the steaming saucepan on the fire. The winter day was drawing towards twilight. Mists hung over the black canal. Through the windows could be seen the zinc roofs of a number of storage sheds attached to the buildings of a steam mill. In the front parlour the horsehair sofa had been drawn beneath the window, and Gwen, her golden head on a faded blue cushion, lay trying a new frock on a great wax doll. The child's eyes looked big and strange in her pale face, and the blue veins showed through the pearly skin. Apathy in a child is pathetic in its unnaturalness, the more so when the sparkle of health has but lately left the eager eyes. Gwen had whitened like a plant deprived of life, her black-socked legs were no longer brown and chubby. She had the unanimated and drooping look of a child languid under the spell of some insidious disease. The garden gate closed with a clash as Master Jack came crunching up the gravel path, swinging his ragged school books at the end of a strap. He grimaced at Gwen and rang the bell with the cheerful verve of youth, for John Murchison was a sturdy ragamuffin, capable of adapting himself to changed surroundings. The young male is a creature of mental resilience and resource. Toys were fewer, puddings plainer, parties unknown, but a boy can find treasures in a rubbish heap and mystery in the dirty waters of the canal. Master Jack's return from school was usually a noisy incident. He appeared loud and emphatic, an infallible autocrat of eight. I say, I'm hungry! bang went the books into a corner of the hall. For the hundredth time Catherine reproved her son, and insisted on Master Jack's primers being put in order on the proper shelf. The boy, much under compulsion, stooped for those battered symbols of civilization, disclosing in the act a disastrous rent in his blue serge knickers. "'Jack, dear, what have you been doing to your clothes?' "'What clothes, mother?' 
the boy's innocent yet subtle obtuseness did not save him from further catechization i only mended your knickers yesterday jack and they were new last month my knickers mother what have you been doing master jack passed a hypocritical hand over a certain region law don't say law dear well i never i was only climbing with bert smith you didn't think jack that clothes cost money it was perfectly plain that no such thought ever entered jack murchison's head children are serenely insensible to the worries of their elders and moreover master jack had at the moment a grievance of his own bert smith's going to the pantomime and he pushed past his mother into the front room swinging his books jack be careful why don't we go to the pantomime it's a beastly shame Catherine's lips quivered almost imperceptibly the blatant self-assertiveness of boyhood hurt her as the thoughtless grumblings of a child must often hurt a mother put those books down dear and go and change your knickers jack obeyed if swinging the books into a corner could be called obedience Catherine restrained a gesture of impatience gwen lying on the sofa winced at the clatter as though morbidly sensitive to sounds you are silly jack shut up mother's tired reproof from a supposed inferior is never particularly welcome jack made a clutch at his sister's doll landed it by one leg and proceeded to dangle it head downwards before the fire jack jack don't the boy chuckled like a tyrant as gwen peevish and hypersensitive burst into a flood of tears Catherine, who had turned her back into the kitchen reappeared in time to rescue the doll from being melted jack i am ashamed of you she took the doll from him and went to the window to comfort gwen john murchison conscious of humiliation adopted an attitude of aggressive scorn silly old doll jack go up to the nursery shan't his courage melted rather abruptly however before the look upon his mother's face he retreated at his leisure climbed the stairs slowly whistling as he went and kicking the banisters with the toes of his boots a grieved voice reached Catherine from the half-dark landing mother yes why can't we go to the pantomime go into the nursery dear and don't grumble bert smith's going i call it a beastly shame jack if you say another word i shall send you to bed five minutes had hardly elapsed before Catherine heard her husband's footsteps on the path and the rattle of his latch-key in the lock in the front room he found poor gwen still sobbing spasmodically in her mother's arms the sight damped the glow on murchison's face hello what's the matter and the anxious lines came back in his forehead nothing dear nothing why little one what is it Catherine surrendered her place to him murchison's arms went round the child gwen though struggling to be brave broke out again in uncontrollable and helpless weeping i i's tired father tired there there you must not cry like this and the big man's face was a study in troubled tenderness what has upset her kate he looked at his wife jack has been teasing her the young scoundrel the boy is in one of his trying moods and she could find no more to say against her son gwen grew comforted in her father's arms yet to this man who had learned to watch the faces of the sick there was something ominous in the child's half fretful eyes in the way she flushed and in the hurrying of her heart he felt her hands they were hot and feverish husband and wife looked at each other tired little one eh yes very tired she lay with her head on her father's shoulder looking with large languid eyes up into his face bye-bye time for little girls who are going to see puss in boots to-morrow gwen's eyes brightened a little her hands held the lappets of her father's coat collar oh daddy murchison felt in his pocket and drew out the envelope with the yellow tickets so would you like to see puss in boots 
yes oh yes little girls who go to pantomimes must go to bed early shall daddy carry you upstairs a tired but ecstatic sigh accepted the condition murchison lifted the child kissed her and smiled sadly at his wife what about your unregenerate son Catherine turned and called to jack who was listening at the nursery door jack dear you may come down a clatter of feet pounded down the stairs quiet dear quiet daddy bert smith's going to the pantomime he is is he well so are we to puss in boots yes if a certain young gentleman is good jack gave a shout of triumph kissed gwen and skipped round the room as murchison went out with his daughter in his arms the boy ran to katherine and jumped up to her embrace i'm sorry mother and his bright face vanquished her sorry jack i tore my knickers and katherine took the confession in the spirit that it was given End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of a woman's war by warwick deeping this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two though the most agile of mock cats cut capers behind the footlights and though forty fairies in green and crimson fluttered their gauzy wings under the pasteboard trees gwen murchison sat silent and solemn-eyed beside her father while her brother shouted over the vagaries of selina the cook the glitter the kaleidoscope colour the gaudy incidentalism of the mummery could charm only a transient light into gwen's eyes she sat beside murchison with one hot hand in his her face shining like a white flower out of the depths of the crowded balcony daddy i'm so tired they were in the theatre arcade with a great electric light blazing above their heads people were pouring from the vestibule a line of trams and cabs waited in the roadway to drain the human flood streaming out into the night tired little one so tired daddy my head it does ache under the glare of the electric arc murchison's face had a haggard look as he took gwen up like a baby in his arms jack was hanging to his mother's hand garrulous and ecstatic a slab of warm chocolate browning his fingers let's go in the tram mother katherine was following her husband's powerful figure as he pushed through the crowd with gwen lying in his arms murchison had hailed a cab a luxury that he had not allowed himself for many a long week the wife caught a glimpse of her husband's face as he turned to her there was something in his eyes that made her look at gwen i say daddy how that old quiet dear quiet the boy's shrill voice died down abruptly he looked puzzled and a little offended and began cramming chocolate into his mouth murchison had opened the cab door gwen katherine's eyes interrogated her husband get in dear can you take her from me the child is dead tired gwen appeared half asleep her eyes opened vaguely as her father lifted her into the cab my head aches mother does it dear and katherine's arms drew close about her we shall soon be home in with you jack the boy scrambled into a corner fidgeted to and fro and stared at his mother murchison followed him closing the door gently and putting up both windows for the night was raw and cold the cab rumbled away over the wilton cobbles the windows clattering like castanets the light from the street lamps flashing in rhythmically upon the faces of katherine and her children murchison had sunk into his corner with a heavy sigh the cab had a sense of smothering confinement for him with the crunching wheels and the chattering windows he was too conscious through the oppressive restlessness of it all of gwen's tired and apathetic face don't jack don't the child stirred in her mother's arms with a peevish cry her brother who had devoured his chocolate had squirmed forward to tickle his sister's legs sit still murchison's voice was fierce in its suppressed impatience jack crumbled into his corner while his mother soothed gwen and stroked her hair 
a distant church clock chimed a quarter as the cab turned a corner slowly and stopped before the blank-faced villa murchison climbed out and took gwen from his wife's arms he unlocked the door and laid the child on the sofa by the window before returning to pay the man his fare how much two bob sir murchison felt in his pockets and brought out a shilling a sixpence and two halfpennies the little cash box in catherine's desk had to be unlocked before the cab rattled away leaving a solitary candle burning in the front room of clovelly in half an hour the two children were in bed gwen feverish restless jack reduced to silence by his father's quiet but unquestionable authority murchison examined gwen anxiously as she lay with her curls gathered up by a blue ribbon he made her up a light draught of bromide sweetened it with sugar and persuaded the child to drink it down master jack murchison was ordered to lie as quiet as a mouse then catherine and her husband went down to a plain and rather dismal supper cold boiled mutton rice pudding bread and cheese when the meal was over catherine glided upstairs to look at gwen she found both children asleep jack curled up like a puppy the girl flushed but breathing peacefully in the dining-room murchison had drawn an armchair before the fire and was stirring the dull coal into a blaze he glanced uneasily over his shoulder as he heard his wife's step upon the threshold Catherine was struck by his lined and thoughtful face. Well? Both asleep. Her husband continued to stir the fire, his eyes catching a restless gleam from the wayward flicker of the flames. I am bothered about the child, Kate. Yes. She turned a chair from the table. This last month. You have noticed the change? Yes, dear. So have I. He rested his elbows on his knees and sat close over the fire, moving the poker to and fro as though beating time. She has lost flesh and colour. There is a swollen gland in the neck, too. This beast of a town, I suppose, with its dirt and smoke. Thank God the boy seems fit enough. He spoke slowly, yet with an emphatic curtness that might have suggested lack of feeling to a sentimentalist. Catherine sat in silence, watching him with troubled eyes do you suspect anything suspect he turned sharply and she could see the nervous twitching of his brows anything serious oh james don't keep me in ignorance she slipped from her chair and sat down beside him on the hearthrug leaning against his knees the child is out of health dear it may mean anything or nothing i am wondering and he stopped with a tired sigh whether we can give her a change of air dear why not she met his eyes and coloured that is if we can find the money catherine pretended not to notice the humiliating bitterness in his voice it can be managed i think mother would take gwen i am sure she would take her murchison smiled the unpleasant cynical smile of a man unwilling to ask a favour grandparents are always more merciful to their grandchildren he said i suppose because there is less responsibility catherine reached for his hand and drew it down into her bosom i will write at once james if you are willing i have no right to object object beggars are not choosers james don't i realize my position dear and i accept it as a law of nature her face wistful with a wealth of unshed tears appealed to him for mercy towards himself don't let us talk of it oh james why should we then i may write to mother yes she knelt up and kissed him beloved if gwen should die life was a somewhat monotonous affair at dr tugler's dispensary method was essential to the management of such a business for there was more of the commercial enterprise in dr tugler's profession than a wilful idealist would have wished surgery hours began at eight and dr tugler was a punctual personality day in day out he bustled into the red-windowed front room as the hand of the clock came to the hour nothing but the most flagrant necessity was permitted to interfere with the precision of his practice and since john tugler did not spare his own body it was not reasonable that he should spare those who worked for hire it was march the second a tuesday with a wet fog clogging the streets 
when james murchison arrived at the dispensary as the clock struck nine the front room packed to its benches steamed like a stable the indescribable odour that emanates from the clothes of the poor made the air heavy with the smell of the unwashed slums dr tugler glanced up briskly as the man entered screwed up his mouth nodded and jerked an elbow in the direction of the clock bustle along mr murchison there are half a dozen cases waiting for you in the surgery murchison said nothing but passed on his face had a white drawn look but he seemed to move half blindly like a man exhausted by a long march in the sun tugler looked at him curiously frowned and then rattled off a string of directions to an old woman seated beside him her red hands clutching the old leather bag in her lap medicine three times a day before meals drop the drink regular food come again next week shilling that's right next please the old woman's sodden face still poked itself towards the doctor with senile eagerness i hope you won't be minding me sir but this it dr tugler became suddenly deaf next please there was something in the atmosphere suggestive of a barber's shop a robust collier was already waiting for the old lady to vacate her chair i was going to ask you doctor this time next week we're busy good morning smith sit down the woman licked a drooping lip with a sharp dry tongue looked at the doctor dubiously and began to fumble in her bag i've got a box of pills here sir as hum tugler cleared his throat irritably and appeared surprised to find her still sitting at his elbow pills yes sir what for the bowel sir need em well sir as i might say sir i'm obstinate very obstinate let's look at the box you don't be thinking doctor there's any harm harm bread and ginger take the lot sit down smith and dr tugler's emphasis ended the discussion with the finality of fate when the room had cleared and the last bottle had been passed through the dispensary window that opened like the window of a railway booking office into the alley at the side of the shop dr tugler marched into the surgery where murchison had finished syringing the wax out of an old man's ears overslept yourself murchison i must buy you an alarm you know if it happens again murchison was washing his hands at the tap over the sink no he said i was up half the night john tugler cheerful little bully that he was noticed the sag of the big man's shoulders and the peculiar harshness of his voice get through with it all right murchison stared momentarily at dr tugler over his shoulder a glance that had the significance of the flash of a drawn sword it was not one of your cases he said private affair eh my child is ill your child yes i'm a bit worried that's all murchison turned the tap off with a jerk rasped the dirty towel round the roller and began to dry his hands as though he were trying to crush something between his palms dr tugler thrust out a lower lip looked hard at murchison and fidgeted his fists in his trousers pockets what's the matter the big man's silence suggested for a moment that he resented the abruptness of the question can't say yet serious i'm afraid so yes dr tugler frowned a little stared hard at the ventilator and pulled his hands out of his pockets with a jerk look here murchison you've lost your nerve a little i'll come round and have a look at the youngster you had better knock off work to-day thanks i'd rather stick to it you might see the child though i well murchison had turned his face away and was standing by the window fumbling with his cufflinks i don't like the look of things i don't know why but a man's nerve seems to go when he's doctoring his own kin that's so and dr tugler nodded then you'll come round supposing we go at once it's good of you bosh and dr tugler turned into the front room took his top hat from the gas bracket and began to polish it with his sleeve End of chapter twenty two Chapter twenty three of A Woman's War by Warwick Deeping. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three. A March wind blew the dust and dead leaves in eddies through the breadth of Castle Gate as Dr. Steele's brougham drew up before the timbered front 
of a Jacobean house. The mellow building with its carved barge boards and great sweeping gables bore the date of 1617, and still carried a weather-worn sign swinging on an iron bracket. For the last fifty years the ground floor had been used as a grocery shop, a dim, rambling cavern of a place fragrant with the scent of coffee and spices. The proprietor, Mr. Isaac Mainprice, a very superior tradesman who dabbled in archaeology, had refrained from gilt lettering above the door. Nor did the quaint leaded windows glare with advertisements, whiskey bottles, and Dutch cheeses. Every one within ten miles of Roxton knew Mr. Mainprice. His prosperity did not need to be flaunted upon his windows. "'Good day, madam. Terribly windy. Permit me.' Mrs. Betty had swept across the pavement in her sables, an opulent figure wooed by the March wind. Mr. Mainprice had fussed forward in person. He bowed in his white apron, swung a chair forward, and then dodged behind the counter. The shop was empty, and three melancholy assistants studied Mrs. Betty from behind pyramids of sweetmeats and packages of tea, for the face under the white toque had all the imperative fascination of smooth and confident beauty. Mrs. Steele drew out a little ivory memorandum book and glanced at it perfunctorily before looking up into Mr. Mainprice's attentive face. He was a weak-eyed, damp-haired man with a big nose and a loose, good-tempered mouth. A patch of red on either cheek seemed to suggest that the épicier cultivated an authoritative taste in port, sherry, and Madeira. "'I want some jellies and soups, Mr. Mainprice.' "'Certainly, madam.' "'There are a few poor people my husband attends. "'I want to help them with a few little delicacies.' "'Mrs. Betty's drawl was most confidently sympathetic, "'and Mr. Mainprice ducked approvingly behind the counter. "'What brand, madam? Lazenby's? Crotts and Blackwell's? "'Oh, the best. What do you recommend?' "'Thank you, madam.' "'Let me see.' "'And Mrs. Betty's eyes wandered with an air of delighted innocence about the shop. I liked the glass jellies best. Six, yes, six, and six tins of desiccated soup. Certainly, madam. The large size? Yes. Will you have them made up into different parcels? I will take them in the carriage. Certainly, madam. Mr. Mainprice nodded sharply to the three melancholy assistants, and then bent over the counter to scribble in his order book. Very windy weather, madam. Mrs. Betty glanced up brightly at the suave, thin-whiskered face and smiled. She had a great variety of smiles, and Mr. Mainprice was an intelligent person, and a man who was not ashamed of wearing a white apron. Moreover, he was an excellent patient, the father of five tall and unhealthy daughters, and the sympathetic husband of a neurasthenic wife. "'Terribly windy,' she agreed. "'This is a dear old house, but I suppose it is rather draughty no madam no we find it very comfortable i have had double windows fitted to the upper rooms they make such a difference such a difference madam there was a short pause mr mainprice was a nervous man he had a habit of sniffing and of opening and shutting his order book as though it was imperative for him to keep his hands occupied dr steele is very busy madam oh very busy so much influenza "'I am afraid, madam,' and Mr. Mainprice elongated himself over the counter with a waggish side-twist of the head. "'I am afraid we selfish people don't show Dr. Steele much mercy.' Mrs. Betty laughed. "'I believe you yourself have been particularly wicked this winter, Mr. Mainprice.' "'I must plead guilty, madam.' "'You are quite well now, I hope.' Mr. Mainprice frowned, and half shut one eye. "'Nearly well, madam.' I ventured out last night without orders. The Primrose League concert? Now, madam, you have found me out. Mrs. Betty and the Epicier regarded each other with a sympathetic sense of humour. We were there, Mr. Mainprice, and I was so annoyed because Dr. Steele was called away just before your daughter sang. Indeed, madam, and Mr. Mainprice sniffed with nervous satisfaction. The best item on the programme, such a sweet contralto and such musical feeling. I remember poor Mrs. Murchison used to sing some of the same songs. Of course, she never had your daughter's artistic instinct. Mr. Mainprice coloured and looked coy. The girl has had first-class lessons, Mrs. Steele. I believe in having the best of everything. 
"'I have been very fortunate, madam, and though I ought not to mention it, money is no consideration.' The grocer straightened his back suddenly, with a mild snigger of self-salutation. "'Money well spent, Mr. Mainprice.' "'Is money invested, madam, exactly, and a good education is an investment in these days.' Two of the melancholy assistants were carrying the parcels to Mrs. Betty's carriage. She rose with a rustle of silks, her rich fur jacket setting off her slim but sensuous figure. Mr. Mainprice dodged from behind the counter and preceded her to the door. "'If it will be any convenience, Mrs. Steele, we can deliver the parcels immediately.' "'Thank you. I want to see the people myself. I like to keep in touch with the poor, Mr. Mainprice.' The grocer's weak eyes honoured a ministering angel. "'Exactly, madam. Permit me.' He edged through the door with a nervous clearing of the throat, blinked as the wind blew a cloud of dust across the road, and escorted my Lady Bountiful to her carriage. "'What address, madam?' "'Thank you so much. Mr. Mainprice, the coachman knows.' And Mr. Mainprice stood on the curb for fully ten seconds, watching Dr. Steele's brougham bear this most charming lady upon her round of Christian kindness and pity. It is wise in this world to cultivate a reputation for philanthropy, though like the priestly dress it may be a mere sanctity of the surface. Few people are honest enough to be open egotists, and to attain our ends it is necessary to skilfully bribe our neighbours' prejudices. Though self-interest is the motive power that keeps the world from flagging, it is neither discreet nor cultured to blatantly acknowledge such a truth for without a certain measure of hypocrisy life would be a sorry scramble. That man should be taught to love his neighbour as himself is both admirable and inspiring, and yet no one who respects his banking account could ever seriously accept so unbusinesslike a theory. There was more shrewd, honest, and unflinching truth-telling in Hobbes than in the vapourings of a flimsy sentimentalism. Now Mrs. Betty had no more love for a washerwoman sick with a carbuncle on her neck than she had for an old and mildewed boot. Poverty and the inevitable sordidness thereof were more than distasteful to her, and yet she was so far sound in her worldly philosophy as to dissemble her distaste for expediency's sake. It is never foolish to be suspected of generosity, and in Roxton, where the ladies counted one another's yearly record as to hats, it was necessary to assume some sort of benignant attitude towards the heathen or the poor. Betty Steele, as the leading physician's wife, recognised the power of judicious and moral self-advertisement. She had lived down her mischievous desire to shock the good people who paid her husband's pleasant bills. No doubt she derived some delicate satisfaction from playing the fair lady in her furs, and from conferring favours on her humbler neighbours. The sense of superiority is always pleasant. That man is a liar who describes himself as utterly indifferent to obloquy or favour. Mrs. Betty stopped at a florist's shop on her way and bought three bundles of Scylla flowers. The golden blooms made a kind of splendour beside her sable coat. Colonel Feverel, Roxton's most antique dandy, passed as she returned towards her brougham, and the brisk sweep of the soldier's hat saved her the trouble of remembering her mirror. At the top of one of the alleys leading to the river, Dr. Steele's wife disembarked upon her errand of mercy. A small boy whipping a top on the narrow sidewalk served as a porter for the carrying of her jellies. One or two greasy heads were poked out of the pigeonholes of windows. Mrs. Betty, demure and sweet as any Dorcas, knocked at the door of number five. "'Good day, Mrs. Ripstone.' An elderly woman in a faded blue flannel blouse had thrust the beak of a nose round the edge of the door. "'Good day, ma'am.' A thin, hard face offered no very fulsome welcome. "'How is your husband? Dr. Steele told me yesterday that he was a little better.' Mrs. Ripstone's lethargic eyes rested for a moment on the small boy carrying the parcels. Mrs. Betty herself bore the golden flowers. "'Much obliged, ma'am. My husband is doing as well as can be expected. Will you step in? We ain't particular tidy.' Mrs. Betty stepped in and sat down calmly on a very rickety chair. "'I have brought you a little soup and two glasses of jelly.' "'Much obliged to you, ma'am.' The two women looked curiously at each other. They were utterly unlike in any characteristic. Mrs. Betty, in her furs, looked like a Russian countess in the hovel of a peasant. 
the room was unconditionally dirty and smelled of burned fat there was nothing to admire in it nothing to provide the lady with a subject for enthusiasm i am glad your husband is better mrs ribstone thank you ma'am the woman in the blue blouse stood stolidly by the table mrs betty's words made no evident impression on her it was as though she regarded the visit as a necessary evil and was only persuaded to be polite by such tangible blessings as might accrue have you any children mrs ripstone stared ten ma'am her brevity was expressive you must be very busy i am that ma'am are they all grown up growed up yes well ma'am and the woman in the blue blouse gave a peculiar smile if you'll listen you'll hear the baby hammering a tin pot in the yard the reek of the burned fat began to prove too powerful for mrs betty's sensitive soul she and mrs ripstone seemed out of sympathy conversation languished the lady with all her cleverness was wholly at a loss what to say next two minutes had passed when dr steele's wife rose she smiled one of her perfunctory smiles at the woman in the blue blouse and turned with a rustling petticoat towards the door i hope your husband will like the soup mrs ripstone thank you ma'am good afternoon good afternoon ma'am the woman watched mrs betty to her carriage and then closed the door with an expression of rather sour relief she turned to the flowers and parcels on the table untied the string and examined the contents wonder what she left em for was mrs ripstone's solitary and cynical remark in her carriage mrs betty was holding an enamelled scent bottle to her nose i wonder why they are so dirty and so reserved she thought i don't think that woman was the least bit grateful i don't like the poor anyway i have done my duty the west was wreathed with the torn crimson of a wind-blown sky at sunset when mrs betty drove home from her essay in almsgiving st antonia's spire a black and slender wedge seemed to cleave the vastness of the flaming west the tall elms about the church were very restless with the wailing of the wind in parker steele's dining-room there was an air of warmth and luxury a sense of deep shelter from the blustering melancholy of the dying day the table was laid for tea a silver kettle singing above the spirit lamp a plate of hot cakes on the trivet before the piled-up fire it was the hour of soft slanting shadows and of the wayward yet sleepy flickering of the flames betty swept into the room with a sensuous satisfaction of a cat the thick turkey carpet muffled her footsteps like the moss of a forest ride at the window his figure outlined by the gold and purple of a fading sky she saw her husband standing motionless his head bent forward over an outstretched hand he appeared to be examining something closely in the twilight she could see his keen clear profile intent and a little stern parker parker the cakes are burning her husband turned with a start taken unawares like the hero of wessex in a swineherd's hut betty steele had glided towards the fire preoccupation thy name is man parker quick your handkerchief the dish is as hot as say something do before the glow of the fire she noticed the irritable frown upon her husband's face most worried of men what is the matter matter fate cannot touch us the cakes are saved misery parker quick the kettle the silver spout was spouting hot water over mrs betty's treasured japanese tray her husband with a damn the thing turned down the cap of the spirit lamp with a spoon what an infernal fool that girl simons is mrs betty drew a chair forward with her foot reached for the tea caddy and glanced whimsically across the table at her much grieved mate the king did not try to shift the responsibility parker dr steele sat down abruptly with the air of a man in no mood for persiflage what were you studying so intently i learning palmistry parker steele helped himself to one of the hot cakes oh nothing he said curtly his wife laughed what a retort to give a woman the physician shifted his chair really betty am i to go into a lengthy dissertation on every trifle because you happen to be inquisitive tell me the trifle and you shall have your tea i was looking at a chilblain on my finger 
what admirable bathos parker i might have taken you for hamlet soliloquizing for the last time over ophelia's tokens oh quite possibly and he began to sip his tea you have forgotten the sugar what execrable memories you women have End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of a woman's war by warwick deeping this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four daddy my head my head lie quiet little one hold her hands kate drink it all down gwen i can't daddy my head oh my head dr john tugler standing before the nursery window bit one corner of his moustache and stared hard at the chimney of the steam mill trailing a plume of smoke across the dull grey of the sky the monotonous cooing of a dove came from a wooden cage hung in the back yard of the next door house a hundred yards away an iron railway bridge crossed the canal and the thunder of each passing train made peace impossible in the little villa dr tugler pulled down the blind beast of a back room he thought they must wring the neck of that confounded bird he turned and stood looking in silence at the two figures bending over the little bed catherine had one arm under the child's head and was smoothing back the hair from gwen's forehead the child's eyes were closed her face flushed tugler saw her turn restlessly from her mother's arm as though the least touch was feverishly resented don't don't there dear there the look in the mother's eyes betrayed how sharply such an innocent repulse could wound come gwen darling i should let her rest dear murchison's voice was peculiarly quiet he was standing at the foot of the bed bending forward a little over the bar his eyes fixed on the face of the child dr tugler moved softly from the window his habitual bluster had disappeared completely his full blue eyes looked dull and puzzled not much of a room this he said apologetically touching murchison's elbow the father turned and looked at him with the slow and almost stupid stare of a man suffering from shock i suppose it isn't we can move her to the front room catherine had caught john tugler's meaning she was kneeling beside the bed her eyes fixed on the little man's plebeian but good-natured face move her mrs murchison at once yes she must be kept absolutely quiet no light no noise catherine looked at him almost helplessly a train was clanging over the iron bridge and the caged dove cooed irrepressibly a living symbol of vexatious sentimentalism there will be less noise in the front room her husband nodded we can have straw put down and tell the next-door people to strangle that confounded pigeon i will ask them and remember no light a shrill cry came from the sick child's lips as though driven from her by sudden flaring up of pain my head my head mother catherine's hands flashed out to gwen hovering as though fearing to touch the fragile thing she loved she tried to soothe the child a woman whose wounded tenderness overflowed in a flood of broken and disjointed words her husband watched her his firm mouth loosened into a mute and poignant tremor of distress tugler touched him on the shoulder let's go down murchison straightened and followed the doctor to the door he looked back for a moment and saw catherine's head a dull gleam of gold above the child's flushed face a strange shock of awe ran through him like the deep indrawing of a breath before some picture that tells of tears his vision blurred as he closed the door and followed john tugler slowly down the stairs both men were silent for a moment in the little front room of clavelli tugler had taken his stand between the sofa and the table and was watching murchison out of the angles of his eyes he was accustomed to dealing with ignorant people but here he had to satisfy a man whose professional education had been far better than his own why didn't you tell me of this before murchison tell you what about the child murchison glanced at him blankly well it was my own affair don't like to bother anyone eh you never ought to have kept the youngster in this beast of a town 
I could have told you a lot about Wilton if you had asked. John Tugler, like many amiable but rather coarse-fibred people, was often most brusque when meaning to be kind. Moreover, he had a certain measure of authority to maintain, and for the maintenance of authority it was customary for him to wax aggressive. I tried to get the child away. Murchison spoke monotonously, yet with effort. We wrote to her grandmother, but the old lady was ill, and put us off with excuses. The child was only ailing then. It was a matter of money. The only money I could lay my hands on was a small sum deposited with the post office in the child's own name. And when I got the money, I saw that it would be no good. The florid little man looked sincerely vexed. "'You ought to have mentioned it,' he said. "'You ought to have mentioned it. I'm not so damned stingy as not to give a brother practitioner's child a chance.' Murchison lifted his head. "'Thanks,' he said. "'I suppose it is too late now.' His eyes met Dr. Tugler's. The grim question in that look demanded the sheer truth. John Tugler understood it, and met it like a man. "'We can't move her now,' he said. "'No.' It is incredible what meaning a single word can carry. With Murchison that no meant the surrender of a life. Dr. Tugler stared out of the window and rattled his keys. "'Did you notice the squint?' he asked softly. "'Yes. And the retraction of the head. "'She's been sick, too. Cerebral vomiting. Damn the disease. I've seen too much of it.' Murchison's face might have been sculptured by Michelangelo. "'Then you think it is that?' he asked dully. "'Tubercular meningitis?' "'Yes.' John Tugler nodded. There was a short and distraught silence before the little man picked up his hat. He smoothed it gently with the sleeve of his coat. Murchison stood motionless, staring at the floor. "'Look here, Murchison.' He glanced up and met the other man's dull eyes. "'You can't work today. It doesn't signify. And about the cash?' "'Thanks, but—' "'Now, now, we're not going to quarrel, are we? The work's been pretty thick this winter. I'm rather thinking you've done rather more than your share. It would make things more comfortable now, wouldn't it?' Murchison gave a kind of groan. "'It's good of you, Tugler. Oh, bosh, man. Am I a bit of flint? Call it another pound a week. It isn't much at that. I'll send you a fiver on account.' He gave his hat a last rub, crammed it on his head, and walked hurriedly towards the door. "'It's good of you, Tugler. I—' "'All right. I don't want it talked about.' The little man was already in the hall and fumbling for the handle of the door. He opened it, slipped out like a guilty debtor, and crunched down the gravel, swearing to himself after the manner of the egregious male. End of chapter 24「twenty five of a woman's war by Warwick Deeping. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five. The windows of Parker Steele's consulting room looked out on the garden at the back of the house, where Lent lilies were already swinging their golden heads over borders of crocuses, purple, yellow, and white. The lower part of the window was screened by a wire gauze blind and the red serge curtains were looped back close to the shutters. However drab and dismal it may be, a physician's consulting room has much of the mystery that shadows the confessional of the priest. The uninitiated enter with a pleasurable sense of awe. Wisdom seems to admonish them from her temple of textbooks piled up solemnly in the professional bookcase. There is an air of suave confidence and quiet reserve about the room. Even the usual turkey carpet suggests comfortable sympathy and the touch of the healing hand. Even as it is unnatural to suspect a priest of the sins he rebukes in others, so to the lay mind the physician appears as being above the diseases that he treats. There is always something illogical in a doctor needing his own physic. And yet, of all men, he is the last that can boast of the bliss of ignorance. He knows the curses that afflict man in the flesh, how grim and inevitable his own end may be. He is too well aware of the malignant significance of symptoms, and a month of dyspepsia may induce him to a state of morbid and half-hypochondriacal self-introspection. 
it is told of a great surgeon how he lay awake all through one night imagining that he had discovered an aneurysm of his aorta it is dangerous to know too little but on occasions it may be desperately unpleasant to know too much it was a serious and rather worried figure that moved to and fro in the lofty room as the march day drew towards a dreary close the house was silent a depressing silence suggestive of stagnation and cynical melancholy a fitful wind set the tops of the cypress trees swaying and jerking in the garden the only living thing visible from Dr. Steele's window was a black cat stalking birds under the shadow of a bank of laurels. Parker Steele had taken off his coat and folded it carefully over the back of a chair. He stood by the window, fumbling at his cufflinks, a preoccupied frown pinching up the skin of his forehead above the thin, acquisitive nose. After turning up his shirt sleeves, he picked up his pocket lens from the table and focused the light upon the forefinger of his right hand. The hand that held the lens trembled very perceptibly. On the right forefinger, immediately above the base of the nail, a dull red papule stood out upon the skin. It was clearly circumscribed in outline and hard to the touch. Parker Steele noticed all these details with the strained air of a man scrutinizing an unpleasant statement of accounts. Presently he laid the lens down on the flap of the bureau by the window, and unbuttoning his waistcoat, passed his left hand under his shirt and vest. The deft fingers half buried themselves in the hollow of his right armpit. Parker Steele's eyes had a peculiar, hard, staring look, the expression seen in the eyes of the expert whose whole intelligence is concentrated for the moment in the sense of touch. His lower lip fell away slightly from his teeth. Sharp lines of strain were visible upon his forehead. Good Lord! The words escaped from him involuntarily as he drew his hand out from under his shirt. The smooth face had grown suddenly haggard and sallow, and there was a glint of ugly fear in the eyes. Parker Steele stood staring at his hand, his mouth open, the lips softening as the lips of a coward soften when his manhood melts before some physical ordeal. The dapper figure has lost its alertness, its neat and confident symmetry, and had become the loose and slouching figure of a man suffering from shock. Parker Steele roused himself at last, forced back his shoulders, and walked slowly towards the door. He turned the key in the lock, and stood listening for a moment before picking up a hand mirror from among the multifarious books and papers on the table. Returning to the window, he peered at the reflection of his own face, furtively, as though dreading what he might discover. The sallow skin was blemishless as yet. Not a spot or blur showed from the line of the hair to the clean curve of the well-shaven chin. In another minute, Parker Steele was turning over the leaves of his journal with impetuous fingers. He worked back page by page, running a finger down each column of names, stopping over and again to recollect and consider. It was on a page dated February the 12th that he discovered an entry that gave him the final pause. Mrs. Ratton, 10 Ford Street, Partus, 5 a.m. A footnote had been added at the bottom of the page, a footnote whose details were significant to the point of proof. Parker Steele threw the book upon the table. Good Lord! He looked round him like a man who has taken poison unwittingly, and whose brain refuses to act under the paralyzing pressure of fear. He, Parker Steele, a... Uh, physician and egoist that he was he could not bring himself to think the word to brand himself with the poor fools who crowd the hospitals of great cities the very vision a hundred visions such as he had seen in the dingy outpatient rooms of old made the instinct of cleanliness in him sicken and recoil for parker steele had much of the delicate niceness of a cat this sense of unutterable pollution struck at his vanity and his self-respect he moved close to the window and stood staring over the wire blind into the garden was it not possible that he might be mistaken 
he could consult an expert and yet in the inmost corners of his heart he knew that the truth was merciless towards him what then the question threw him into a more desperate dilemma he remembered his wife again his profession he would have to abandon it for one year perhaps for two and parker steel knew that success in professional life is largely a matter of personality withdraw that individual power and the whole structure like the city of an eastern fable may melt abruptly into mist baffled and irritated a man with no great moral hold on the deeper truths of life he moved aimlessly about the room holding his right hand a little from him like one with bleeding fingers who fears the blood may stain his clothes the leather padded consulting chair stood empty before the table parker steel dropped into it by the casual chance of habit and sat staring dully at the patterning of the paper on the wall it was the ordeal of an egoist unlightened by a signal sense of self-abnegation or of public duty mercenary motives and professional ambition prompted a compromise at any hazard the temptation to procrastinate is ever with us and the man of the polite world is the most ingenious of sophists for more than half an hour parker steel sat silent and almost motionless in his chair when he at last left it it was with the air of a man to whom sanity the sanity of the self-centred ego had returned after the hideous doubt and discord of a dream the wisest course was for him to temporize seeing that it was possible that he might be mistaken he recognized no immediate need for trusting any one with mere suspicions was he not a physician and therefore wise to all precautions as for his wife that was a problem that might have to be considered the sound of the front door closing roused him to the needs of the impending present he noticed to his surprise that it was growing dusk and that the room was full of deepening shadows is dr steele in simons it was his wife's voice and parker steele slipped into his coat and unlocked the door tea nearly ready dear parker are you there yes any one with you no i will be with you in a minute he groped for a box of matches on the mantel-shelf and lit the gas turning he was startled by the reflection of his own white face staring at him mistrustfully from the mirror over the fire it was as though parker steel shirked the glance of his own eyes he had a sense of unflattering discomfort and deceit as he walked to a glass-fronted cabinet fitted with drawers that stood in one corner of the room they were in the middle of tea when betty steel glanced at her husband's hand have you hurt yourself parker i yes ah the pathetic chilblain of course has it broken her husband felt afraid behind his mask of casual indifference i must have rasped the skin and got some dirt into the place he said a mere nothing i have just put on this finger stall so you have heard that the de la mottes are leaving eh they were not much good in the town so far as the practice was concerned parker steel's reply to his wife's question had flashed a suggestive gleam across his mind very probably it was too late for him to defend her against himself and even if his fears proved true he could swear absolute ignorance as to the presence of the disease no guilt attached to him he was merely striving to neutralize the effects of a damnable and undeserved misfortune End of chapter twenty five